Tonight, we're going to um, jump back into a passage of scripture that we actually centered our gatherings on uh, this past summer. And um, we're going to look at this like amazing, challenging passage in Romans chapter 12. And what we're looking at in these series of verses is these are a series of verses that talk about what it means to actually be a true disciple of Jesus. And, uh, you know, a lot of people claim to be disciples of Jesus. Have you noticed this? There are a lot of people on Facebook who claim to be disciples of Jesus. Then go ahead and don't act like a disciple of Jesus immediately after they claim that. Um, Like a lot of people, they'll say they're Christian in name only, but then proceed to have it not impact their life in any way. And you've probably noticed this. And one thing we want to try to be as a community is be people who actually don't just like talk the talk, but they walk the walk. And I, I kind of had an experience, something similar to this. Um, you know, I grew up in the Philippines. My parents are missionaries. And in the Philippines, the national language is Tagalog. And Tagalog, uh, it's, it's spoken a lot of places in the Philippines. But the thing about the Philippines is that it's such an Americanized country that you can get away with speaking English pretty much everywhere. Like when, after World War II, when, when America liberated the Philippines from Japanese, and they helped set up the, institu- the higher education institutions, uh, like, you know, they taught people how to be teachers and doctors and nurses, and, and it was really incredible. And they used English as kind of the primary way to, to teach. And so because of that and such the impact that American culture has had on the Philippines, it's like you can get around and you can use English pretty much everywhere. People love speaking English. So that made it very easy for someone like me, being a lazy kid, not wanting to learn a second language, uh, it, made me, it made it very easy for me not to learn that language. But then I learned like a couple, you know, you know kind of growing up, you learn a couple phrases here and there. And um, one, one other thing that happens with a lot of uh, Tagalog language speakers is that they, they use a lot of English words within their Tagalog. And so they call it Taglish. You know, we have like Spanglish here with, you know, Spanish. Uh, but it's Taglish is very real. And so they'll just kind of, and my dad, who's a missionary, used to preach in Taglish. He would preach and preach and preach and say an English word and then preach and preach and preach. And so this is kind of like the, what I grew up in. And the school that I went to was this international school and we spoke English. So again, I didn't have to like totally dive in to like what it meant to be like a Filipino speaking Tagalog um, and so I, but then I like, as I grew up, like I said, I like, kind of, I learned a couple phrases and I feel like I got the gist of what it, you know, I knew enough to kind of like hang out and like see what's happening with uh, people who only spoke Tagalog. And a couple years ago, um, I went back to the Philippines to shoot some videos uh, for my uncle and a lot of his uh, churches and his camps uh, in Manila. And one thing that we had to do is I was filmed a lot of interviews and a lot of these interviews, uh, these people speaking Taglish. And I, one of the things that I had to do was that at the end, I had to go back and translate it and like have to write this English subtitles on the bottom. So as I'm doing the interviews, I'm like, how am I going to, okay, I think, I think I get the gist of what they're saying. I, I could probably make it happen. And in my head, I'm like, I could probably make it happen. And so I get home. And again, my dad is a fluent Tagalog speaker, grew up in the Philippines, was missionary for, for 20 years. And I tell my dad, I'm like, Dad, I'm like working on this, like I put my laptop up there. I'm like, I think he says something about his life was hard, and then there's like something about drugs, and like that's kind of all I got from it, Dad. What, like, can you help me like with the rest of the words? And he said, Rob, you've only identified the English words that he used in this, in this thing. You knew none of the Tagalog. Like you, he, he said hard life and drugs. That's the only thing that you took. And I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't think I know Tagalog. I don't think I know. That was like the like aha moment for me where I'm like, I guess I don't know this as well as I thought I did. And um, I was a person who kind of like claimed a little bit to know a little bit of Tagalog. I dabbled in it. Uh, but then when push came to shove, I didn't know it. And it, if not for my dad, I would have failed this project miserably to not translate the words into English so that an American audience could see it. And do you know that many people will say that they're a disciple of Jesus, but when push comes to shove, they have no idea what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus is kind of like learning a new language. Like with the stuff that's like natural to you, what you would normally want to say, you have to think of it in a different way. And you have to think of it in a different, a different culture. You have to figure out a new way to, to think and to act. And in Romans chapter 12, 
at verse 9 through 21, the passage that we, we started in the summer that we're going to continue uh, for the rest of this semester, the Apostle Paul is really teaching us what, is, what it means, teaching us the new language of a disciple of Jesus. He's teaching us a, a new standard, a new thing to compare yourself to. And the, 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 whole, the whole passage is pretty interesting. Can you pull up this next slide? This is kind of like an overview of what the Apostle Paul was trying to tell us. In the first part, what we've talked about already, is verse 9. He talks about what pers- your personal responsibility as a disciple of Jesus. He looks and he says, this is what you need to be doing. The next rung is, okay, now that you've dealt with your, your personal stuff that you need to figure out and kind of learn the new language of God here, the next is you need to figure out how that impacts your family relationships, how that impacts your relationships with other sisters and brothers in Christ, like other Christians, other church people. And then the, the next rung, and we're going to finish that up today, the next rung is the other just general people. In your life, it doesn't have to be Christians. These are just like how would being a disciple of Jesus impacts just everyday people, whether they believe in God or they don't. And then the last thing at the end of this chapter, he even talks about okay, you're a disciple of Jesus, this is how you deal with enemies, this is how you deal with people who do not like you. These are this is kind of the, the idea like being a disciple of Jesus impacts your own person. It impacts the way you deal with other Christians. It impacts the way you deal with other people. And it even impacts the way you deal with people who hate you. And so we're going to read uh, the, the verses that we've done so far. And we're going to end on verse 13. And we've talked about this at length. And if you missed any, you can go to our YouTube page and, and check them out. But I want you to, like, sit and, like, rest in this instruction from the Apostle Paul that he is giving all of us as a Christian. This is what he says. Verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love each other with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And the verse that we're going to talk about today is this. It's verse 13. And contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. To contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality. This is a verse that seems pretty straightforward in what it's asking us to do. But this is something that can seem so ordinary that we just pass on by it saying, okay, yeah, we get it. But this is something that I think really does separate a follower of Jesus, a disciple, a true, actual disciple of Jesus, amongst other things. And a key concept that we need to understand, if we're in here, if you're in here, and you're trying to figure out how you can actually be a complete transformed person, how you can be a disciple of Jesus even better. The key concept that you need to remember and you need to know is that being a disciple of Jesus is not flowing inward. It's not like this, I just have to learn more and think more and achieve more. Listen, listen, the key concept that we need to understand as a follower of Jesus is that the flow of the supernatural life is always outward. It's always outward. That Jesus has saved you. He's transformed you. He's made you into the image of, of, of Jesus. God has made you into the image of his son, Jesus. And this is not for just your benefit. You realize that when Jesus came and he, and he died on the cross for us, the, the, he did not say, all right, guys, we did it when he got rose again on the third day. He's like, we didn't, we, he didn't say we did it. Let's just kind of huddle around. And we'll, this is like we can talk about this for the rest of time. No, 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 the application, the like automatic response of anybody who has been changed, been marked, been totally transformed by Jesus is this supernatural life. And this supernatural life always flows out. It always flows out to other people. And often it is represented by meeting the needs of people. So tonight I want to give you three really simple really clear takeaways about verse 13. And my hope for you tonight is that you begin to think about the real needs of the people around you. And that when an opportunity 
to translate God's goodness to another person comes about, that you would not be like me and say, I don't really know the words. I don't really know how to, like, Dad, can you help me? You could actually be aware and ready to be able to translate God's goodness to the people around you. But you got, if in order to do this, you have to be ready. You have to be present. To, and you have to be ready to represent your new family of God. And so tonight, if you want to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, you have to ask yourself three questions. And the first question that I want to talk to you guys about tonight, and the first question that I think would help enable us to do what God has instructed us to do in this passage, is this. Number one, am I aware of the needs of others? Am I aware of it? It says to meet, is to meet the needs, to, to show hospitality, but so often, like, you will not actually accomplish something unless you know where the need is. You guys know this? You'll never meet the needs that you don't see. And there's, like, this, there's this phenomenon that we, we all kind of have. I, I know when I first moved to Orange County, um, I, the first, like, six months, I, like, towards the end of that, I remember someone said, like, have you noticed all the Teslas that are around? And I'm like, no, I haven't really noticed the Teslas. It's crazy. He's like, it's like the Southern California Camry is a Tesla. And I was like, oh, that's, that's crazy. I never really noticed it. And then right after he said that, I started to notice Teslas like crazy. Have you guys ever done that? Like I remember just like everywhere I went, I'm like, there's a Tesla. There's a Tesla. There's a Tesla. And then like this, this kind of stuff happened to you probably when you got the car that you got. Like I, when I got a Honda CRV, I started seeing Honda CRVs everywhere. All right. And then I would see, an, I would like pull up to another person with a Honda CRV and be like, you get it. You get it. We're together on this. You know, there's like this kinship that you have with people of the same car. Uh, it doesn't make sense, but it's, but it's good. Have you guys ever had this phenomenon happen to you? Like you never notice anything, then all of a sudden you experience this one thing, and then you see it all over the place? Do you know what that's called? That's actually called frequency illusion. That's a frequently, frequency illusion. It's a psychological term, and this is what it says. This is, a frequency illusion is cognitive bias in which after noticing something for the first time, there is a tendency to notice it more often. Leading someone to believe that it has increased frequency and occurrence. Like, the question is, did I, did I, was there actually more Honda CRVs after, on the road after I got my Honda CRV? No. I just was not looking for it before. And now I'm looking for it and I notice a lot more. And this, listen guys, if, if, you're, if you dye your hair blonde, or red for that matter, you're probably going to notice more blondes or redheads. If you get a tattoo, you're probably going to notice more people with tattoos. And listen to me, when you become a part of the family of God, there are things that you need to know and be aware of and remind yourself about with greater effort than other people. And one of those things is to be able to contribute to the needs of the saints. And what this means is just like you, you contribute to the needs of other brothers and sisters in Christ. You contribute to the needs. You look for opportunities to help those people in your life that you know that love Jesus. You need to look for an opportunity to actually bless them and help them and be an encouragement to them and contribute and be a part of what's going on in their life. And the question, when I first read this, I, I, I just, I don't know about you, but like I thought, I'm like, okay, but aren't we supposed to do this with like everybody? Have you, have you ever seen that? Like, aren't we supposed to, like, shouldn't we do this with every single person? And, you know, it's clear by even the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus made it very clear that we as believers are supposed to help anyone in need. That we need to look and we need to seek the needs of people. But... What this passage tells me and what other passages have confirmed is that we have a greater responsibility to the family of God. In Galatians 6.10 and 9-10 through 10, it says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. That's a, a, I love that verse that encourages me in seasons of hardship or when I feel like nothing's happening. But the next part of this verse is interesting. It says, So then, as we have the opportunity... Let us do good to everyone. There it is. But listen to what it says after this. Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. So if you are a believer, what, what this text is saying 
is he's saying we need to be aware of the needs of the people in our family. And this makes sense, right? Like you wouldn't, if, if your brother or sister is really struggling, you wouldn't, over, you wouldn't look over them to help another person that's not in your family. You would meet the needs of the people in your family first before you're able to do anything else for anybody else. And I, I really, this is something that we need to be aware of. We need to be looking, like when you go to church, when you go to Tuesday night here for the gathering, when you go to your small group, when you're around people of faith, you need to be aware of the needs of other people. And the question is, are you even aware? Like, do you know the needs of the people in your small group right now? Do you know the needs of the people that you sit next to on Tuesdays or Sundays? And maybe for you, in order to obey this passage to contribute to the needs of the saints, maybe you just need to go and start asking some questions. Be like, hey, how can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? What, what are some things that are going on that you need? And listen, you're not going to be able to help everything. And you're not going to be able to help everybody. But what you need to be aware of is like, are, have you helped anyone? Like, have you, have you like asked anything to anybody like that? Are you aware? Number one, you, you got to be aware of the needs of others. And number two, the question you need to ask yourself, am I willing to make myself uncomfortable to obey God? Am I willing to make myself uncomfortable to obey God? You know, one of the, one of like the clearest ways, like there's many examples of how to contribute to the needs of the saints, contribute to the needs of other believers. Uh, but one of, the, one of the main things that we do as a church here at Crosspoint is we, we support missionaries. We support missions. And that's near and dear to my heart because I'm from a family of missionaries. And what's crazy is this church has actually supported my family through generations. My, great, my grandfather on both sides, both my grandfathers, have been at this church years and years and decades and decades ago. And it was through people of Huntington Beach, California, that contributed to the needs of a saint in Manila, Philippines, and Cebu, Philippines, that my family was able to do the work of ministry, to see many people come to know Jesus, disciple many people. And listen, guys, the only way that we were able to do this was through people in this church and many churches throughout the country who just believed this verse and, like, actually contributed to the needs of saints. And, you know, there, one thing that, one thing that we, we talk about, we, I don't know if we talk about it a ton, but we, giving is such an important topic in the church because really giving illustrates where you are in your heart, like where, what you actually worship the most. And one thing that we do as a church is we have our, we have our tithe that we, we give back to God what is, what is owed to us. That We don't really look at that as generosity. We just look at that more as an honor thing. But then what we do on top of that is we actually give to missions every month. And we're able to support missionaries through giving. And every year, at the end of the year, we're coming up on it, we do this thing called the Christmas Missions Offering. And we take a big offering at the end of the year, and we raise, like, you know, a lot of money, tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and we just give it away to other Christians. We give it away to other missions organizations. We give it away to other missionaries that we support. And we're able to, to come together as a church corporately, to meet the need that is there. And by doing, this is one example. There, there are other things that you, definitely that you can do. But this is one example as a church wide that we're able to give to the needs of the saints. And maybe for you, one of the ways that you could try to like step out and obey this verse, like it's all about, uh, you know, taking your next right step. Maybe for you, a, a way for you to do that is just at the end of this year, contribute whatever you can to the Christmas missions offering. What's awesome about this is we don't keep any of the money. We just give it right away. We just, we just give it all to our missions, missionaries, and we say, this is from us. Bless it. Use it. I hope this is used for gospel ministry in your context, in your area, in your part of the world. As a, as a community of believers, this is how we perpetuate the gospel all throughout the world is we come together and we contribute. We come together and we support. We come together and we do what we can for the people that we can, the people that we know. And when you make your, and this is uncomfortable, because how, how many of you guys know that when you give a little bit, you actually have less, and that stinks. Have you guys noticed that? Yeah. Giving, giving, makes you have less. Breaking news. 
you will have less after you give. But here's the deal. When you actually take what you have and you contribute it, what happens there and the heavenly exchange rate, you get back way more than you have received. Sometimes, I've had this happen in my life where I have, I have like, God has led me to, to do something, give something, and God is supernaturally, like, I could tell you crazy stories of God giving me about the same amount that I gave or giving me a job for the exact same amount of money that I gave. I've heard crazy stories about that. I've experienced crazy stories like that. But I can't promise you that you will always give money back when you give. But let me tell you something. When you give, God will bless you. And it's, this is not like a health and wealth situation, but what you do when you bless the Lord, when you acknowledge with your heart that God, I'm, I'm gonna give this to you, I'm gonna contribute because I wanna obey you, there is always blessing when you obey the Lord. There's always blessing when you do this. And it's uncomfortable at times. And you may have less than what you started with, but God will show up in your life. I promise you that. I promise you. It may not be what you think, but it may be what you need. And the, question, and the thing that I want to encourage you with today is maybe you're, you're, you're like really comfortable. You're like a little too comfortable in your relationship with God and getting in the game with contributing to the, to the needs of the saints or people around you. Maybe you, sh you need to have this be reflected in your life. Maybe you need to set up your budget and you just add a line item. You're like, okay, I'm just going to give, I'm going to give this to this person. Or I see a need, one of my friends, they're really struggling. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them this. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to contribute in this way. Whatever it may be, try to get in the game. Try to figure out how you can do this. And there are going to be times when you are uncomfortable but those are the times where maybe you need to step out in faith and just say, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I believe you. I believe what it says in this scripture, and I don't, this isn't much, but I'm just going to step out in what I know. And guys, when you get, with, with this idea of money specifically, when you get your heart right with that, man, God can, God can do some amazing things in your life. So you got to be able to get uncomfortable every once in a while. And the last thing. The last question that you need to ask yourself to the second half, of, second half of this verse is this. Number three, am I pursuing the love of strangers? Am I pursuing the love of strangers to contribute to the needs of the saints and to seek to show hospitality? Do you know the word seek to show hospitality in the Greek, which is the language that w this book was written in Corne Greek and Common Greek? The, the, the term to seek to show hospitality literally translates into Pursue the love of strangers. Are you pursuing the love of strangers? When you seek to show hospitality, when you're looking for ways to show hospitality, you are seeking to love people that you don't even really know. You know, uh, some of my good friends, Andrew and Steph Albritton, um, I, I sent out a, a story, uh, my Instagram story. It's like, hey, does anybody have any, you know, times where we were like hospitality really impacted their life and and my buddy Andrew called me he goes he's like listen I'm never on social media but I just like for some reason I, I pulled it up and I saw your thing and I'm like I need to call you about this and Andrew proceeded to tell me a crazy story of how the hospitality of another family so so impacted their life Andrew is one of my smartest friends. Like he's like the, he's got a PhD in communication. Like when he talks, he kind of just has this way of talking that you're like, dude, that's smart. That guy's smart. I don't know what he is, but he's smart. You know, um, like he's just he's he's very intelligent. But Andrew's also just like a goofy dude. Like he's he's one of my favorite people in the world. And Andrew, when he was working on his PhD, he and his wife uh, he they were going to continue his education in the University of Nottingham in England in the UK, and so. Um, he and his wife, they picked up and they, they moved to England and they knew that they would have a couple days to go house hunting. And so he's like, okay, if it's anything like America, a couple days they can be able to run a credit check, we'll be able to find an apartment, like no problem. And so he gets there and the university, they only have housing for single uh, students. They don't really have any housing for uh, married students. And so they knew that going in and they were trying to work on it beforehand and, and they get there and they realize very quickly when they first get there, they get a hotel for a couple days, and they realize that it's not going to take a couple days to find housing. It actually might take a couple weeks 
and even further beyond. And he said that they didn't have a lot of money to be able to just extend their hotel stay for a long time. And so they started, he was like, it wasn't totally freaking out yet. And so he's like, I'm just going to call the university, maybe see what they have, anything. You know, they, they might be able to help us out. And he called the university, and the university said, we have zero spots available. Like, there's nothing that we can do. And so they're like, oh, okay, like, this is... This is not good. Um, and so then he's like, okay, what we need, we'll extend. We can't afford to stay in the hotel like long term, but we're going to have to extend for like maybe a couple more days. And so he goes to extend his hotel stay. And the hotel people are like, we don't have any more room. Like zero room, but we're not going to just kick you to the curb. We're going to call some other hotels in the region and we're going to try to figure out a way for you to get something. And Andrew said that we didn't have, like, it was, we're in a different country. We don't have Wi-Fi. We don't have the ability to, like, find out uh, if there's another hotel in the region. So they did the most American thing ever. They went to a McDonald's. And they hung out and tried to, like, find uh, a, a place to stay. And the, the, the hotel called them back, and they're like, uh, I am so sorry. There are literally zero rooms in the region right now. And they're like, what's happening? And they said, there's a fight going on in town. And it's like, it, we don't know if it's MMA or like a WWE, whatever it could be. Um, and Andrew's like, it felt like a WWE fighter punched me in the stomach. And I'm like, I, we don't have a place to stay tonight? You know, and you're just like, what? Like, this is, it's like, it went from like bad to worse. And so Andrew was just like, okay, I gotta, we got to figure something out. And so he called a missionary that, that they knew that had worked in this area. And he said, hey, do you know of anything, like is there any way that we could talk to anybody that has a connection, that ha knows a place to stay from some, from some area? And so they're like, hey, we know this family. They're actually Middle Eastern refugees that we work with that do ministry, uh, gospel ministry in your area. So I'm going to give them your number, and maybe they will be able to help you. And so he, he, they call this family. And it's, they, they're just like, they're trying to ask him, like, hey, do you know of any other places a little bit further away? Like, maybe we can just, like, you know, use the metro to come in uh, to this area, but we just got to find something. And this guy, he answers the phone, and he hears what's going on. He goes, hold on one second. And he comes back and goes, hey, I talked about my wife, and why don't you guys just stay with us? And they're like, no, 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 like, we're, we're complete strangers. Like, we don't know you. Like, you're, it's like you wouldn't want to have us in your house. Like, it's totally fine. Like, we, we just were looking for any, like, connections. And they're like, no, 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 no. They said it's really hard to find a good, you know, place to stay in this area. And we, we recognize that it's really difficult. So we want to just offer this up to you. So we, we would love to have you over. And so they talked about it. Eventually, they're like, like we got to stay somewhere tonight. So they went. And as soon as they got there, the, the husband came out, and they, you know, they got their bags out, and he was, they were so hospitable, and their family was showing around the house and everything like that. And again, these are, guys, they're in the UK. These are Middle Eastern refugees helping out this American family, trying to figure out a place to stay. And Andrew said when, he's like, there was something different about this family. And when this family, he looked at me in the eye, and he said, listen, Andrew, you stay here as long as you need. And you said, you know how a lot of people say that, like, hey, come over any time, and they don't really mean it. Um, he said, this, this was different. He, when I looked him in the eye and he said, stay here as long as you need, he meant it. He meant it. And, like, he said, they, they, so they ended up staying with him. And they said that they would, like, they took him all around town, and they showed him all the different things. They fed them their food. They, they taught them about their culture. They, they were able to pray with them. They were able to let them live with them. And it was like, Andrew and Steph said this was like one of like the greatest like moments of our lives because we were shown such incredible hospitality by a, a refugee from the Middle East in the UK. Like this is all, this story is crazy. And what he found out later is that this, this man, this, um, this family, um, one of the other people uh, that were supporting them, they said, hey, we want to support your ministry and work here. So we're going to give you this house. And they got to stay in this house for free. And so they said that they looked at this house. They said, man, God has given us this house. It's such a blessing. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be able to look at this uh, as to, to bless other people as well. And they did. And they made it a huge, huge impact on the lives of not only my friend Andrew and Steph, but he said they took in multiple, multiple people during that time. They were, they were blessed to be a blessing. And I think... We need to remember that hospitality, biblical hospitality, to seek to show love to strangers 
it's such a, it's such a foreign concept. It doesn't happen anymore. You don't, you don't automatically drift into better hospitality and biblical hospitality. This is one of those things that you ask by the Spirit of God working on you from the inside out to be able to make you into a person, to be able to obey what Jesus said in his word, to be able to make you into a person of hospitality. And we need to remember, if this is what we want to do, like we have been so blessed and we need to, whatever God has been blessing us with, we need to look at that as not something that is ours. We need to look at that as just something that God has given us for right now in order to use to bless other people. And maybe you're here today and you think that you have a lot of things in your life that you're like, man, I've been, I've been, I have like, I have a lot of the blessings that I have in my life. It's, it's because of my intellect or it's because of my drive. It's because of my personality. I was able to do all these things. And can I just remind you today, who gave you your intellect? Who gave you your personality? Who gave you your drive? Who gave you your ability to make money? Who gave you your ability to make friends? Who gave you your, leader, your leadership ability or your talent? Who, there is one person who gave that to you. And he gave that to you not so he could just enrich yourself, but to enrich the people around you. Remember, God's blessing does not stop with you. God's blessing should move through you. Remember, the flow of the supernatural life is always outward. It is always to people. It is always to help. It is always to bless. It is always to contribute. It is always to be with people, to, to show hospitality to people. And if you're part of the family of God, you're a part of new expectations. There are new rules for you. There is a new family value. And when God's people are in need, you need to be ready to help them. You need to always be eager to practice hospitality. But the questions you need to remember today, and I just, as I, as I look at you, I just want you to be people who are so transformed because when you actually live this transformed life and it flows out of you, you will be blessed. You will be blessed. So are you aware of the, the needs around you? Are you willing to make yourself uncomfortable to obey God? And are you pursuing the love of strangers? Let's pray.